Hi, everybody. I'm Dennis Daly. I spent 20 years with United Press International, most of it with the old UPI radio network. And my favorite assignment was going on the road producing and hosting American Montage. It was an hour-long weekly program. Now here's an edited version of one of those shows. Hi, everybody. We're on the road again and in a spot in eastern Ohio that brings back many, many memories of my childhood. If you're a regular listener to this program, you know that I grew up in rural Indiana, but spent a lot of my life in Washington, D.C. Before moving to D.C., my family often visited there two and three times a year. That meant we had to drive across Indiana, Ohio, a little bit of West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Maryland. And I'm old enough to remember that a lot of that drive was on old Highway 40. In a little town called Norwich, Ohio, there is a marvelous museum not just to US 40, the old national road, but to the history of road building. As we began to drive a little faster on our way to Washington, D.C. because of new sections of interstate, we found that Norwich, Ohio was to the mile exactly halfway between my parents' home and my uncle's home in D.C. And there in Norwich was a sprawling motel called Baker's Motel. We stayed there many times. Now across the road from Baker's, the Ohio Historical Commission has built a beautiful museum that capsulizes the history of the National Road. The curator is Alan King. Let's walk around this marvelous hidden away museum and look at one of the most tremendous displays I've ever seen. It's called a diorama, little miniatures depicting the evolution of the American highway. What the Ohio Historical Society has done in this case is to depict the building and use of the National Road beginning in 1811 when construction began in Cumberland, Maryland, and we carry the viewer through to Vandalia, Illinois, so we carry them the 600 miles of the Federal Highway. We also carry them ahead in time from 1811 uh, to about 1920 or so when uh, the uh, automobile was really beginning to make its impact felt. You know, one of the things shown very graphically here that I think we tend to forget, the very first part of this is the felling of trees and the burning of the uh, the debris is how thickly forested the eastern U.S. was before we came here. It was, uh, by all accounts, a very densely forested area. Well, now this sounds almost like the debate that's going on in the American West now. Let's preserve what's left of the wilderness. Absolutely. Uh, this was... Uh, a magnificent area by all accounts, uh, huge trees uh, that uh, pretty much shaded the, the land from, uh, from any penetration of sunshine during, uh, even during the height of the day. They say that traveling some of these trails with the overarching trees was like traveling through a tunnel. Well, let's move on to the second uh, panel here. Here we are, as you say, moving ahead in time. We've, we've gone from an era where they have simply uh, scraped the land clean and the bridges were very primitive not very long spans, just uh, logs across a way of holding them up. This is a a representation of, uh, where is this, in in Cumberland, Maryland, crossing one of the the large chasms there. It's a a double arch bridge. Yes, this is just outside Cumberland, Maryland, just west of Cumberland, uh, crossing a tributary of the Potomac. This is Wills Creek. So this is a, a body of water that will eventually end up in Chesapeake Bay. And uh, just to the west of us then would be the watershed where the rivers would would, uh, travel to the Ohio. And that's what uh, the National Road was really intended to do, to be a uh, portage link between the eastward flowing Potomac and the westward flowing Ohio. So we're talking about an era now in which uh, the main highway is still what we would call gravel. Uh, but there are bridges, and we're talking about, uh, with Conestoga wagons, the era what now, right before the Civil War? This is approximately 1830, 1840, uh, and this particular section of the diorama represents the only major rerouting of the National Road. Originally, the road followed Braddock's Road over Haystack Mountain, uh, which was a very steep grade. In about 1830 or so, the, the Army Corps of Engineers rerouted the road through a section called the Narrows, adding some mileage but making it much more level and much much more easy to, tra- to travel. One of my favorite pastimes is to try to follow the original alignment of the National Road, and uh, I'm not alone in that. There are many, many people who, uh, who attempt to do that. But there are certain little uh, indications that we look for. Uh, as you say, we, we look at topographical maps and look for the little oxbow roads that meander from and then back onto uh, U.S. Route 40. In many cases, there were towns along these roads that still exist. 
Then down here we have a beautiful winter scene, and this is uh, around 1840, it says, in Zanesville. Here is, uh, a, by that time, there was a streetcar, of course, pulled by horses, so we're moving along, and uh, a lovely bridge across the river. This bridge swings like a, like a turnstile, uh, well, a turnstile or turntable. This uh, swing bridge is, uh, or was, at the uh, canal section of the Muskingum River in Zanesville. This canal was not built for canal boats, not for horse-drawn canal boats, but rather for steamboats that would ply the Muskingum River uh, because there is a section of rapids at this particular point in Zanesville. And this canal still exists. The swing bridge is gone, but uh, the canal is still in use. The, the lock system on the Muskingum River in Ohio is the only hand-operated lock system left in the United States. And uh, it uh, goes from Marietta, Ohio, uh, at the mouth of the Muskingum on the Ohio River, uh, several miles north, uh, even beyond Zanesville. There's kind of a little joke that the uh, artisans have put in here. There's a fellow, uh, a little model of a fellow, his hat's blown off, and he's about to fall over in the wind. There's, there's a lot of humor in this diorama. The, the artists uh, really let themselves go, and, and it's very enjoyable to look at. Well, now, something else we cannot pass by, and there's a beautiful photograph of it here when it was a covered bridge, and that is that in the middle of the river, in Zanesville, just five or six miles west of here, the bridge splits up and goes left and right. It is indeed a Y bridge. Is there any place else in the world where you can tell somebody to go to the middle of the river and take a left? <laughs> well, at least no place else in this, in this hemisphere that we're aware of. Uh, the first Y bridge, Y-shaped bridge, was built in Zanesville in 1814. There is still a Y-shaped bridge there. It is the fifth one that's been c constructed. And uh, this is kind of what gives Zanesville its identity. Zanesville is known as the Y-bridge city. Mm -hmm. And according to the Guinness Book, uh, this is the only bridge that you can cross and remain on the same side of the river that you started on. <laughs> it's amazing. The mile markers uh, are sometimes mistaken for uh, tombstones, headstones, uh, by modern-day travelers. But uh, they were erected, one every mile, to... Uh, enable the people traveling to keep pace of their of their uh, travels so, so they could tell how far they had gone how far they had left to go to their destination they were the road signs of, of their era and of course they're very small by today's standards they were meant to be read by people traveling three to four to five miles per hour not people traveling 55 60 65 miles per hour very difficult to read at that speed but the, the mile markers in Maryland Pennsylvania and West Virginia along the National Road are cast iron and few of them do remain. In Ohio, they were uh, constructed of stone, uh, hand-carved stone. I know you have quite a few out front in the yard. Yes, yes, we have. Uh, as the highway, as old Route 40 was widened and straightened, uh, several of the mile markers were uh, simply cast aside. Um, some of them were lost. Uh, some of them were collected by the uh, State Department of Transportation. And some of those have been, we've been able to bring onto the museum grounds here. Specifically applied to the National Road, uh, there was a, an Indian whose name was applied to the trail, Nemecolon, in uh, Maryland and Pennsylvania. And his trail uh, provided the, the, uh, the template, sort of, the, the, the uh, path that would be followed by General Edward Braddock as he was moving his troops from Fort Cumberland in what is now Maryland to... Uh, to uh, uh, move the French out of the Fort Duquesne area, what's now Pittsburgh. That is why you see occasionally it referred to, being referred to as Braddock's Road yes. in, in, in that area up in Maryland. And the National Road from Cumberland to um, oh, into uh, western Pennsylvania, uh, the Uniontown area, did follow Braddock's Trail for the most part. And then it broke off, uh, traveling on more in a more westerly direction toward Wheeling. Alan, it's a wonderful place. Uh, it's on Old Highway 40, right at the interchange with, uh, with I-70 in Norwich, Ohio. It, it commemorates uh, a wonderful era, long gone, and uh, I want to thank you for preserving it and, uh, and show a lot more people through here. It's a great place. My pleasure, indeed. Thank you very much. <laughs> And there you have it, another edited episode of one of the American Montage programs prepared for the UPI Radio Network back in the 1980s and 90s. I'm Dennis Daly. Thanks for listening. Thanks for going with me this week. And check YouTube for more American Montage programs. <laughs>